Good morning. It is my pleasure to welcome you to this year's Petit Distinguished Lecture. I'll introduce our speaker in a second, uh, but it's really great to be in person, and I'm happy to see all of you here. Um, I want to start by thanking the IBB staff for putting this event and really for the terrific job uh, that they do. So please join me in thanking them. I also ask that you turn your silence your phones so we don't have any um, interruptions that will then get me to kick you out of the room. So, um, and I want to remind everybody that we'll have a luncheon following uh, the presentation today. So it's truly my pleasure uh, to host this year's speaker, uh, Professor Paula Hammond from MIT. Paula is an institute professor, and she's also the department head of chemical engineering. And she's a member of the Koch Institute for Integrative Cancer Research. Paula received her Bachelor's of Science in Chemical Engineering from MIT. And after working for a few years, uh, she uh, worked at Georgia Tech at GTRI. And she also completed her Master's in Chemical Engineering in record time in two years. That's, that's very impressive. This is while working full time. Uh, then she went back to MIT for her PhD. Uh, after completing her PhD, she did a postdoc at Harvard University in the chemistry department. And then she joined uh, MIT as a faculty member afterwards. Uh, she has an impressive list of attributes. I'm not gonna go uh, through all of them. The ones that really uh, are important to highlight is that uh, she's an elected member of all three national academies, which is a tremendous uh, feat. Uh, and also she's a member of President Biden's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology. So I'm sure her next two years will be quite uh, enjoyable. Um, she has received uh, additional awards, including the American Institute of Chemical Engineers, Margaret H. Rousseau Pioneer Award for Lifetime Achievement by a Woman Chemical Engineer. And she also has uh, received and given the Materials Research Society David Trumbull Lectureship, which is uh, one of the highest awards that MRS uh, conveys. Uh, Paula's research is on nanomedicine and encompasses the development of new biomaterials to enable drug delivery from surfaces with spatial temporal control. She has over 330 papers and over 20 applications and it's a co-founder of the company uh, Layer Bio. I would say also that uh, you know, in addition to being really an outstanding uh, researcher and leader, she's a very dedicated mentor. Um, she's a great colleague and, and she's really an inspirational researcher. So it's really wonderful to have you with us. So Paula, please come up. And obviously the test is that uh, we don't fall off the stage. So <laughs> thank you for being here. Thank you so much, Andres. And I, I really am excited to be here. Uh, as Andres said, I was um, a student here. I got my master's and uh, worked at GTRI. And I remember the campus then, which looks nothing like it looks now. <laughs> and uh, I've since then, had friends here at Georgia Tech for years, and it's so good to see so many friends in the audience right now. I'm going to describe work in which we use electrostatics, uh, positive and negative charge, to build thin films, which we can use for a range of applications. And the work I'm going to focus on uh, is the nanoparticle systems that we've been generating using these kinds of ideas. Uh, typically, uh, in our work, we start with some sort of negatively charged substrate and absorb oppositely charged species, a polycation was absorbed, followed by a polyanion, and we can build up thin films layer by layer. Um, however, in our work, we've been looking at how we might be able to build films not on larger substrates, but on nanoparticles. In this work, we're inspired by uh, the problems we've been introduced to in the Koch Institute of Integrative Cancer Research. Uh, in which we're really thinking about whether or not we can create combination nanoparticles for cancer therapy. The idea here is that there are a large number of cancers that are highly resistant, uh, and they're resistant to chemotherapy because of genetic mod modifications that have taken place uh, through the cancer. And one way of addressing this is to stuff 
a nanoparticle with a chemotherapy drug, uh, a cancer killing drug essentially, and then layer on a series of polyelectrolytes which include a nucleic acid. And that nucleic acid, siRNA, can silence the gene but enables those tumor cells to be resistant. So in this case, we have essentially the core nanoparticle, which is often a liposome in our case, but can also be a PLGA or polymeric nanoparticle that, that degrades. Uh, we incorporate inside of that our platinum drug, for example, cisplatin, uh, or a range of other drugs that can kill cancer cells, often through DNA damage. Uh, we can then layer on a positively charged polymer, we use poly-L-arginine, uh, which is a polypeptide, so it breaks down into a natural amino acid. Uh, we then put down in this blue layer, siRNA, followed by another positively charged layer. So now we have this plus minus plus sandwich uh, that has been built, and that gives us an encapsulated siRNA. And uh, essentially, this is going to allow us to release the uh, drug that is going to silence those genes. Finally, we can't deliver the nanoparticle through the bloodstream if we're going to maintain positive charge on its surface. The reason for that is that positive charge is going to be highly effective in absorbing a large number of, of plasma and serum proteins rapidly, and will also engage with cell membranes, which is, uh, uh, often leads to toxicity. Uh, when it absorbs all of these plasma proteins, it often comes out looking like junk, to uh, monocytes, to those immune cells that are monitoring our bloodstream for things that need to be um, eliminated. And those monocytes take those nanoparticles on a path to rapid clearance out of the body. And the idea here is that we need this nanoparticle to circulate for a long period of time in the bloodstream so that they can ultimately make their way to the site of the tumor and across the blood vessels of, of that tumor. This is what these systems look like. And I don't know, it might be that we have a lot of bright lighting, so you might not be able to see all of this, but this is a liposome uh, before we've put down our layers. And this is a layer by layer coded liposome where we have the four layers I described before. Um, this is a polymeric nanoparticle and we've coded it with the same four layers. And you can kind of see that ghost layer on the outside. These are typically going to only add about 20 to 30 nanometers to the size of the nanoparticle. So our nanoparticles start off 100, they may be 120 nanometers when we're done putting down our layers. And that is the size that we're interested in for our cancer applications. I can see that uh, the, the lighting may have affected the screen image a little bit. So I'll describe when you can't see very well. And I don't know if it's possible ultimately to change these bright lights that are way up here and <laughs> uh, actually make it a little bit difficult to show microscopic images. Um, but uh, here we're uh, basically showing that this outer layer that we choose is a negatively charged polyelectrolyte. And typically uh, we're taking advantage of two things. One, that it is a native polysaccharide, and that native polysaccharide uh, often has a large amount of association with water molecules. So it's a very hydrated outer layer. And two, it's very strongly negatively charged. And those two things are on our side in terms of the biophysics of these nanoparticles, because uh, they ultimately will undergo electrostatic repulsion with a large number of mammalian cells, which tend to have these bound, negatively charged glycans on their surface. So negative and negative gives you some repulsion. Um, but also with all of that hydration, uh, you essentially have a lot of sort of enthalpic and entropic uh, mechanisms that prevent the absorption of those serum proteins. Um, there's a penalty for a serum protein absorbing and disrupting uh, the water molecules that are already highly associated there. And if we um, uh, think about the fact that we're compacting what is really kind of like a loopy shag carpet layer of polyelectrolyte uh, and confining it, that actually gives us a loss of entropy and that's energetically unfavorable and tropically unfavorable. So we have this outer layer and through the physics of that outer layer, we have less protein absorption than we would uh, in our positively charged system. And we also have uh, essentially an opportunity to do one more thing with that layer. Along with the stealth mechanism that allows the nanoparticle to get through the bloodstream uh, with less elimination, all nanoparticles get eliminated, 
but this is going to decrease that elimination and give us longer time. Um, we also have the ability to use that outer layer to associate with specific cell types. And it turns out that hyaluronic acid is one of our favorite outer layers. How many of you are already familiar with hyaluronic acid? I'd love to see through a show of hands. All right, this is an HA crowd, which I love. Um, and some of you may already know that hyaluronic acid is very interesting for the cosmetics industry because it carries so much water. Uh, it's a very hydrated and uh, it's, it's actually um, a native part of our extracellular matrix. HA also binds the CD44 receptor, which is a natural receptor. It, it shows up uh, perhaps in greater quantity in cells that are rapidly regenerating. But it turns out that tumor cells often have a huge overexpression of CD44. And that overexpression of CD44 means that the hyaluronic acid nanoparticle tends to associate uh, with those tumor cells. And so you can't quite see it here, but there is red, uh, red labeled nanoparticles that are associating with these cells that have blue nuclei. Uh, and this gives us a, an ability to get essentially association and uptake into the cell. And uh, we can also look at what happens when we inject these nanoparticles in the bloodstream uh, in an animal, in this case, a mouse, where we have tumors. In this case, this is a triple negative breast cancer uh, tumor model, and these were subcutaneous tumors. Um, and what we're looking for in this section, this histology section, is uh, the nanoparticles in green are associating with the tumor tissue, which is labeled for the CD44, uh, receptor in red, and the green and red are overlapping here, giving a kind of orangey color. Um, the nanoparticles are actually able to penetrate through the stromal cells. Uh, you can see these blue nuclei. They don't have CD44. They're not tumor cells, but they are fibroblasts that support those tumors. And we get through the stroma and into uh, the tumor tissue itself. So that subcutaneous model is a very simple model. And we looked at triple negative breast cancer as a way of probing whether these nanoparticles could work in the general scheme of things. Uh, but we really needed to test in more sophisticated and realistic models. Uh, now, non-small cell lung cancer is the very aggressive form of, of lung cancer. Um, and it represents 85% of all lung cancer cases. Uh, there are two very frequent mutations that occur in non-small cell. Uh, one of them is the presence of the KRAS oncogene. And this oncogene is uh, one that enables uh, a highly mutagenic behavior um, and uh, oncogenic uh, sort of reproduction and, and invasive behavior of, of cancer cells. Um, but KRAS is a gene, uh, essentially a protein that isn't very easily druggable. There aren't small molecules that have been developed that block the KRAS gene. However, we can use siRNA to silence it. So this is an interesting um, sort of target. Also in uh, this kind of lung cancer, the P53 gene is often affected. P53 is a good gene, it's a guardian gene. It actually determines the amount of DNA damage that is taking place in the cell. And when there's a little bit of DNA damage that can be repaired, it directs repair of that DNA. But if there is significant DNA damage, it actually determines that that cell needs to kill itself and undergo an apoptosis event. Um, if P53 is missing or has a single point mutation, we lose that monitoring function. And when we're drugging tumor cells, this is an advantage to them because they will not die then in the presence of our chemotherapy drug. So uh, we can actually use a microRNA that can replace the function or some of the function of P53. This one is known as MIR34A. And uh, that will actually replace some of that original guardian function. So in uh, this simple nanoparticle design, uh, we essentially have our liposome that has cisplatin, that's a DNA damaging drug that kills tumor cells. We wrap it with our polycation. We chose polyalarginine for a variety of reasons. Uh, polyalarginine is known to help endosomal escape, get this nanoparticle out of the endosome after it's been taken up. Uh, we then put down our siRNA and our microRNA together, adsorbed in one layer. On average, this adsorption step leads to about 2,000 to 3,000 copies of the uh, siRNA or microRNA per nanoparticle. We can then put down our polycation, polyalarginine, and finally our outer layer, which is our HA, our favorite molecule. 
All right, now if we look at what happens with release in vitro in a test tube, uh, we can see that siRNA comes out first. This is not surprising because it is in the outer layer. So just through the principles of diffusion, it can diffuse out. And it turns out that if we lower the pH, these layers swell and eventually unwrap. And uh, that's what happens in the endosome. So we can get siRNA coming out rapidly. Um, the liposome, which contains the cisplatin, um, it becomes leakier as those layers begin to expand and uh, deconstruct. And that gives us cisplatin coming out, uh, but coming out more slowly. So we then tested these nanoparticles. And to do that, we looked at uh, healthy mice and mice uh, that essentially um, had this uh, KRAS gene and the lack of P53. And when we inject our nanoparticles in healthy mice, we look at where they go. Uh, they generally light up the entire mouse, which means that we do have systemic behavior. It's going through the bloodstream in and, in and out. Ultimately, it, it ends up in the liver after 48 hours, which is where uh, we have that filtration process before excretion. However, in the mice that have lung cancer, we can see that there's a huge accumulation in the lungs, about 40 to 50 fold higher accumulation in tumored lungs than we see in the healthy animals. And we looked at the uh, lungs of these animals, they have a uh, large amount of CD44, which we can see from staining uh, due to the presence of these tumors. So we know that targeting works. We can then take a nanoparticle that is loaded with our drugs and compare what happens when we inject the mouse. And what we can see here is a vehicle control where we have uh, tumors. These tumors don't glow, so now we have to use micro CT to look at them. So the red is meant to indicate uh, an example animal where we have a large uh, tumor growing in the lung. And what we find is that uh, with just the RNA, we get somewhat of a smaller size. With the cisplatin, we get somewhat of a smaller size. With the combination, uh, we get much smaller tumors that are present. Um, when we look at the survival of the mice, uh, the original um, not untreated mice uh, have a much more rapid uh, uh, loss of life. Uh, however, in our combination system, compared to, for example, the cisplatin, we can see a 30% improvement in the survival of the animal because of the presence of the siRNA and microRNA. So we're excited about the use of siRNA as an approach for uh, tumor treatment and nanoparticles that enable siRNA, which otherwise is very rapidly degraded and very rapidly eliminated in the body, uh, to be targeted to tumors in a way that allows it to be effective. However, um, we also are very interested in some of the big problems in cancer. Ovarian cancer is one of those cancers that hasn't made the progress that we've seen in triple negative breast cancer, and in breast cancer, I'm sorry, and in um, prostate cancer, and a range of other cancers where we have found and understood specific targets that we can use to address those cancers because of their genetic abnormalities. It turns out that uh, it is fifth in cancer deaths among women. Um, and there aren't any very clear genetic targets for personalized therapies in ovarian cancer. Unfortunately, the numbers for ovarian cancer have not changed very much in 30 years, uh, unlike a number of other cancers where we've made very real and, and substantial progress. Um, it turns out that the reason for this is that it's often detected very late. The symptoms are very um, uh, ambiguous, uh, difficult to pin down and, and fairly broad in range. Um, and it turns out that often uh, patients who are feeling something wrong are, are told that it's not uh, anything to worry about until it gets to a, a much greater stage. And at that point, uh, when it is discovered, it's at uh, stage three or four. Now, it turns out that if you use a, uh, a strong chemotherapy treatment, um, a large number of patients will have an initial uh, recovery from cancer. That primary chemo treatment often leads to 70% of patients responding. However, after that, between 70 and 85% of those patients experience a recurrence. Uh, it may be months to years later, and that recurrent form is often a highly resistant form. Uh, which begins with what's called as known as minimal residual disease, cancer cells that hang on and uh, essentially are resistant to the original treatment and find their way back. Um, uh, unfortunately, uh, a great approach to this would be to make the immune system attack any residual tumor cells. However, 
common immunotherapies have not been very effective in ovarian cancer. And there's been very little progress in its treatment over the past 30 years for those reasons. So in looking at ovarian cancer, we didn't have a singular siRNA target. Uh, and we decided to take a more fundamental approach. Uh, we thought, let's think about how we might be able to uh, introduce a chemotherapy drug to a tumor first, and then think about what kinds of therapies we can use with that approach. And with that, we went back to the drawing board. We thought we only really need two layers on our nanoparticle to have a targeting outer layer. We can start with our nanoparticle core, put down a positively charged layer, and then look at different outer layers. And the idea was, can we find an outer layer that has a very high affinity for ovarian cancer cells? If so, then we can think about a range of systemic treatments, intravenous or intraperitoneal, where we inject directly into the abdominal cavity where those tumors tend to grow, including the metastases. And if we have a nanoparticle that is sticky to the, these tumor cells uh, in solid tumors, then we may be able to the, address them with a therapy. So we started with this small library. Um, we looked at carboxylated polyelectrolytes that we felt familiar with, uh, as well as a number of sulfated surface chemistries. Uh, and uh, in looking at them, uh, we essentially used uh, a high throughput method to generate uh, these uh, systems and then examine how much uptake uh, we saw in 10 different ovarian cancer cell lines. And we also looked at seven non-cancer cell lines. And this was work by Santi Correa, uh, who's now a professor at Columbia University, just getting started. Um, in his work, uh, we were able to determine that there are indeed some interesting nanoparticle formulations. One of them wasn't surprising, hyaluronic acid. It showed up again, and uh, it turns out that CD44 is highly overexpressed in a number of solid ovarian cancer cells. We know that it binds the CD44 receptor, and it also uh, gives us this HA, it tends to be very hydrated, so it gives us these really long circulation half-lives of about 28 hours, which is quite long. But we also found, too, that had an either, even higher binding affinity uh, for these tumor cells than hyaluronic acid, in fact, uh, by a factor of five or so. And these were polyalglutamic acid and polyalaspartic acid, really simple homopolypeptides. Uh, we didn't know of any known binding partner no specific receptor that uh, these were engaging with. Uh, we've, we've done a little bit more fundamental work on this system. We're beginning to get some clues, but because we're still in the discovery phase of that, I won't go into those clues now. I will say that there's no very obvious uh, protein binding receptor that uh, is associated with these. Now, uh, given the lighting, I hope these show up, and if not, I'll just describe them as we move along. Um, but uh, we decided to look not only at uh, the, the fact that we have a high amount of association of nanoparticles using cell sorting, but where do the nanoparticles go uh, with, within the cell? And uh, we looked at hyaluronic acid, and uh, you can see, uh, let's see here. Hopefully, as you go through confocal, you'll see green uh, nanoparticles show up, and they're here in the middle of the cell, and they're in endosomal compartments, and that's what we expect, endosomal uptake and ultimately endosomal escape. Uh, with polyglutamic acid, on the other hand, uh, we saw something kind of weird. It turns out that in these systems for ovarian cancer cells, the nanoparticles associate very much at the cell membrane and they remain there sometimes for 48 hours or longer. Typically when we have interactions with the surface membrane, uh, there's some receptor that takes it up or there's uh, macro uh, penocytosis or some form of uptake. And this guy does not get taken up. We thought that was interesting. Um, and finally, we have polyalaspartic acid, um, the other really sticky nanoparticle. Let's see if I can get that one started. And when we look at that one, we have some in-between behavior. Um, it turns out that hyaluronic acid leads to um, a clathrin-mediated process for endosomal uptake. Polyalgutamic acid does not undergo uptake. Polyalaspartic acid undergoes this uptake, but it does it... Uh, slowly through a caviolar process. And in that process, they begin at the surface membrane and slowly go in over a period of a few days. So very slow uptake mediated by caviolin. So here we have three different outer layers that have very different behaviors. Can we 
understand what's going on, and can we use that as a mechanism for drug delivery? And it turns out that sometimes science isn't linear. So um, we're just beginning to understand the mechanism of the middle one, but we are, as I said, uh, still in that, uh, in that place where we're undergoing a series of proofs, and we may learn more in that process. Um, however, we are able to think about how we might be able to use this middle guy, because these are nanoparticles that stick at the outer surfaces of the cell. And when they do that for long periods of time, uh, we can think about them as cargo vehicles that rather than carry something into the cell, like the HA nanoparticle, siRNA, or a poison, a toxin, what if we use this as a way to deliver something to neighboring cells and deliver them to those surface cell membrane receptors? That gives us an opportunity for delivery without having an endosomal uptake that is acidify acidifying our drug and therefore breaking it apart. So a protein would be interesting. Well, it turns out that there are a number of proteins that are designed to activate the immune system. And in this work, uh, which we are doing with Daryl Irvin, uh, we decided to look at uh, one that is very interesting for cancer, IL-12, because it is very effective in creating an active immune environment or what's often called a hot tumor environment. Um, it's a 70 kilodalton protein. Um, it is active on T and NK cell membrane receptors as, as well as a range of um, uh, dendritic cells. And what it does is it, it basically signals these uh, activated cells uh, to generate interferon gamma. And interferon gamma then leads to the infiltration of more immune cells uh, that ultimately become activated uh, and specific to the tumor if there are tumor antigens around. So if you have tumor cells that are dying, or if you cause them to die by introducing uh, a toxin, um, you can actually get a very nice response. IL-12 has been interesting for cancer research, but it's also a very toxic uh, molecule uh, with a lot of potential off-target effects. It, it can actually activate the immune system wherever it is. So if it's in your bloodstream, it can also cause you to have an autoimmune response, which is very negative. And that is what happened with early clinical trials of IL-12, which is why it was sort of put on the shelf for a while. So we're interested in delivering nano IL-12 using the nanoparticle technology that's targeted. Uh, there's Daryl in this work with Daryl Irvin. So my uh, former student, Tony Barbario, started this work and uh, he decided uh, to attach the IL-12, this was an IL-12 fragment from uh, Daryl's lab, uh, attached it to the lipid in the liposome. And in this case, uh, we used a nickel his tag because uh, in Daryl's early chemistries with this IL-12, this SCIL-12, is this is one of the easiest ways to attach. So we attach it to the lipid uh, and build these liposomes that have IL-12 decorating them. Uh, these are still negatively charged lipids, so we can put down a positively charged polymer, polyalarginate, and then polyglutamic acid, our sticky uh, outer layer. If we look at uh, the release kinetics, you know, in this formulation, uh, we used FRET to determine when or whether IL-12 or the polyalarginine was still associated with the particle. And what we found using that FRET analysis is that slowly the polyalarginine comes off and uh, then the IL-12 follows. So in this mechanism, we think that we get docking onto a tumor cell and that gradually in that tumor microenvironment, the polyelectrolyte bilayer falls apart or destabilizes. And in, after that, this nickel his tag destabilizes and releases the IL-12. So we have this mechanism in which we're slowly setting forth the IL-12. And we looked at several simple models, uh, MC38, which is a really common colon cancer model, but tends to be very responsive to uh, immunotherapies. It worked well. Uh, but the question was, can it work in ovarian cancer, especially in syngenetic models, models where uh, essentially the genetics of the mouse are, uh, the immune uh, system of the mouse is intact. Uh, and so we used a syngenetic model of uh, cancer, HM1. Uh, and we also looked at whether or not we could eliminate the toxicity of IL-12. So the first thing we did was dose healthy animals with a, a good dose, 10 micrograms of our IL-12, and uh, IL-12 
uh, without any sort of nanoparticle formulation does cause uh, significant loss of survival shown by these arrows and loss of weight in these animals. Um, however, in our nanoparticle formulation, we no longer see loss of life and we see that we can maintain the weight of the animals. When we then begin to look at treatments, uh, we have an aggressive model um, uh, and this is the HM1 model. Uh, the animals typically die in about 20 days. Uh, and this is just the untreated set. Uh, when we look at IL-12, when we dose the animal, uh, we get some immediate death just because of the dosing. The arrow and the uh, loss of life are coincident, meaning the IL-12 is the reason for loss. And then ultimately the tumors um, end up creating um, additional loss of life. If we look at our IL-12 nanoparticle in this formulation, uh, what we see is that we're able to get an extended period uh, of survivability and some permanent uh, recovery of the cancer, 30% uh, who actually uh, maintain survival. So we were excited about this because it showed that we could actually eliminate the tox and we could extend lifetime. Uh, of course, we had to look at whether or not the mechanism is the mechanism that we think it is. And so in this work, uh, what we did was compare uh, you know, the uh, essentially the number of immune cells that were active in these different formulations. And using these colors, the unlayered nanoparticles are not targeted. There's IL-12 NEAT and IL-12 nanoparticles with the PLE outer layer is, are the red. And what we found is that we got a very nice uh, number of NK T cells, as well as CD8 positive T cells and NK cells. Um, this is in the tumors. Uh, in the ascites, we don't see as much of an upregulation, a little but not very much. Uh, what was important to us was that in other parts of the body that we don't see this upregulation. And in the spleen, we don't. This is because we don't want IL-12 uh, getting to other parts of the body. If we get a significant amount of systemic levels of IL-12, we get back to that toxic issue. So, you know, in summary of this work, we had in, you know, demonstrated this, that this outer layer of PLE promotes ovarian tumor cell targeting and the cell surface retention of the nanoparticle. And uh, we used that to essentially bind our LBL nanoparticles to the surface and release IL-12 to neighboring immune cells. Um, and as we began to think about the mechanisms, how this might work, why it would work, uh, we're still asking the question, um, how is the immune cell interacting with IL-12? Is it getting freed and then uh, the immune cells interact with it. If that's the case, would we have a more robust response if the tumor cell just held on to the IL-12 and we were able to just present it for extended periods of time in the tumor, in the solid tumor itself? So um, my uh, now current student, Ivan, uh, picked up this work. And the idea was let's look at a stable covalent anchorage of the IL-12 as opposed to the nickel his tag. And let's compare the two. Is it better to release this guy or better to hold on to it? Um, and uh, so here uh, is the chemistry. We replace nickel his with this malyamide cysteine linkage uh, to the IL-12, which is the uh, green structure that we're showing here. And we had a rationale for this, uh, which you know part of it was clinical translation because nickel is not going to go into uh, translation as readily as uh, this malleamid uh, uh, conjugation. But we also thought that, again, the way we present may actually be meaningful. So we have these different control groups uh, where there's no treatment, where there's free IL-12, where there is an unlayered nanoparticle that has the nickel his tag and the layered nanoparticle or the targeted one, which has the nickel his tag, and then the unlayered and the targeted malleamid system. And uh, here we look at a single dose uh, study in which we are injecting um, uh, with the uh, IL-12. And what we're finding compared to the untreated is uh, of course the free is giving us a little bit of recovery, but not very much. Uh, and what is really exciting here is that the red line is the targeted malleamid, uh, which compared to the targeted uh, nickel hiss is giving us significant improvement in that survival. So now we are stretched out over a larger number of days. And uh, this is uh, something survival that is significant. Uh, we found that if we did multiple dosings, the same amount, so uh, in all cases, this is 10 micrograms, but now we're gonna do 
or I'm sorry, 50 micrograms, but now we're going to do 50 micrograms split into, into five different injections on day seven through 11. And when we do the multi injections, we see that uh, we get full survival of the entire group for the Meliumid uh, targeted IL 12 nanoparticle, which was very exciting for us. Um, we also found differences in each of these formulations uh, where the, the most important is that the free IL-12 gives us some, but not all um, sort of uh, uh, recovery. Um, and the uh, unlayered versus the layered, the targeted versus the untargeted give us significant differences. So targeting is important and retention at this cell surface is important. I'm skipping a little bit of this, but uh, these uh, spots on the side, these bars are indicating um, that this is essentially a, um, a, uh, a very specific targeting uh, to the tumor cells. Um, and uh, we, we, this is basically the Ellie spot counts in uh, blood cells. Here, what we're showing is rechallenge. So if we take those mice that uh, survived and we inject a new tumor and look at their survival, we see that they also survive and that the new tumor does not grow. So this is one of those tests of whether or not you have induce that immunity. And uh, this is uh, uh, the, the last, the HM1 model is one uh, that works very well for us. We have one that is more immunogenic and one that is less. This one is less immunogenic. And even in this less immunogenic form, we can see that the malumid LBL with the uh, IL-12 is much better in extending that survivability than any of the other formulations. Again, Having that covalent linkage means that the nanoparticle is sticking onto the surface of the cancer cell and exposing the IL-12 for extended time periods. Uh, so we have since done work in which we've shown that indeed we see this retention of the nanoparticle in solid tumors over extended time frames, And that retention, if it correlates with IL-12, gives us this extended behavior. We're still looking at a number of questions on how this works. Is this layer really eroding? We think now that it is actually um, contracting or changing its conformation as opposed to completely falling apart, uh, making uh, the liposome leaky and uh, allowing more access to the protein. Uh, but when the protein is freed, uh, we see that there's a very different impact on treatment than when it is retained. So I'm going to pause for a minute. Um, and talk more broadly about these nanoparticle systems. And uh, in this work, uh, I, really, this is the work of two unusually um, uh, amazing postdocs in my lab, uh, Natalie Bunke and Joelle Strela. Uh, now, Natalie just started her faculty position at University of Minnesota in uh, chemical engineering. So if you see her, tell her hello. Joelle Strela is actually a, was a clinical postdoc. She had a special postdoctoral um, uh, fellowship that allowed her to spend time in my lab as an MD. Uh, her work is in pediatric oncology and she focuses on glioblastoma uh, and has now become a clinical investigator at the Koch Institute, which is a, an independent uh, trans transitional uh, post for her as she begins to find her faculty position. Uh, Natalie focused on ovarian cancer. So this was a uh, sort of a cross cancer um, question that we were asking about how nanoparticle systems work. Um, and the basis for this was that we have a platform, this layer by layer platform that allows us to change out the core. So it can be a liposome. It can be um, a, a polymeric nanoparticle. It can be dense or it can be hollow. It can have different stiffnesses. And then on top of that, we can layer these polyelectrolytes. And these polyelectrolytes change the, the physical chemical interaction with other cells. So if we can, mod in a modular fashion, modify all of these things, we have the ability to build large libraries. And we wanted to ask a few questions about what components are important in nanoparticle design for targeting tumor cells. This work was done in conjunction with my colleague, Angela Kohler at the Koch Institute, um, who has uh, worked with the Broad Institute on a range of different projects uh, for drug discovery. And what she did was introduce us to an important tool at the Broad Institute. Uh, basically, this tool is called the PRISM platform, um, and it allows you to create 
uh, large numbers of particles and do these massive parallel pulled screens of nanoparticles. And uh, PRISM had been designed uh, not just for nanoparticles, it had been designed for small molecule drugs, in fact. And uh, the readout for the PRISM platform is cell death. However, we decided to use the PRISM platform as a mechanism for measuring cell association with nanoparticles. And in doing so, um, we generated a range of different platforms. We had just liposomes with nothing uh, but, uh, you know, just the lipids themselves, and then layered with a range of different uh, layer by layer systems. And you can see a range of them here. We also looked at liposomes with pegylated lipids in no layers at different ranges of pegylation. We looked at some controls, liposomes with an EGFR uh, targeting antibody, uh, just with an IgG alone, no targeting, and a range of uh, a couple of different known formulations, Doxel being one of them, Anya V being another that are actually commercial. We looked at PLGA, polymeric nanoparticles with a range of different coatings and with polystyrene in the same fashion. So we have this large number of nanoparticles. And in these pooled screens, um, you have one nanoparticle formulation dosed per well for your cells. What's exciting about the uh, PRISM platform is that the Broad Institute has accumulated a broad range of cancer cells. Many of them are patient derived. And uh, these cell lines are maintained uh, such that they can essentially be um, cultured under the same conditions and pulled in a given well. So you can have 488 of these cell lines in a well. The way that we can differentiate one cell from another is that they each have a different barcode, a DNA barcode, uh, which can then be used uh, to determine who is who using PCR. So these are individually labeled uh, cancer cells in a well, one nanoparticle per formulation. Um, and uh, we had 35 of these fluorescent nanoparticle formulations that we tested. Um, and when we did this, we had two screen points. They were time points. One was four hours, one was 24 hours. If we had infinite amounts of money, we would have looked at a range in between there as well, but this was a good start. And um, essentially what we did was cell sort these into bins. We had four different bins from low to high amounts of association, fluorescence um, with these different cell types. And then we would take those cells from the different bins and we'd sequence them and uh, see how uh, that sequencing then gave us information on the cells that we were working with. And because those cells uh, were um, already documented with respect to the genes that they express, what we could do then was determine whether or not there were genetic biomarkers that seemed to be associated with the nanoparticle, uh, nanoparticle high association. So what you're looking at is the four and the 24 hours. And up and down, you see the same library that I showed you before. And uh, what this is saying is number of significant biomarkers, meaning uh, number of significant genetic markers, if you want to think of it that way, um, that are associated with the cells that are associating with our nanoparticles. Uh, and you can see for a number of our formulations that have very interesting, for example, these polysugars, dextran sulfate, alginate, um, this uh, fucoidal system, there are a lot of biomarkers, meaning there's a lot of genetic um, association with that. The biomarkers aren't surprising. Uh, if you look over here on the right, uh, we tried to name some of them. So for those of you who are highly uh, biologically inclined, you might get into that. It's, uh, <laughs> I let my biology friends help me understand what those mechanisms are. Uh, so we have solute carrier uh, proteins. That's perhaps not surprising for some of this association. Focal adhesion pathways. Uh, we have a range of different transport mechanisms, vehicle mediated and SLC mediated. Um, so there are some markers. They do tend to be in the areas that we think might have to do with moving things in and out of cells or sitting at the cell membrane. Uh, so we asked a couple of questions. Can we take those biomarkers and use them to map and understand different trafficking networks that might be associated with the different nanoparticles we work with? So, you know, this is just 
giving you a scheme or a schema, you may have different nanoparticle systems um, and they may have genetic biomarkers, but some of them may overlap with other nanoparticle systems. Uh, and some of them may be unique to that nanoparticle. Can we, by looking at the unique hits, identify specific networks that are associated with the nanoparticle interacting with these cancer cells? So for example, the PLD nanoparticles, you remember those that sort of had that very slow caviolar uptake in our ovarian cancer cell? It turns out that a lot of the biomarkers associated with those uh, PLD nanoparticles are associated with uh, intracellular networks, uh, intracellular uptake biomolecular pathways. And the PLE that we spent so much time talking about have very few of those and a lot of enrichment in uh, proteins and genetic pathways associated with binding and cell surface markers. So there is some correlation and maybe we can use this to understand uh, and ultimately um, extrapolate to other systems. What was interesting is that uh, if we use uh, a range of different forms of data analysis, including random forest analysis, um, we can begin to understand whether or not there are some universal uh, genetic characteristics for systems with high uptake. And here, we're looking at these random forest volcano plots where you see that there may be biomarkers that are more or less associated with um, uptake or association. We'll use the word association for now. At four hours, we don't see that there's anything very unique, but at 24 hours, we see that there's something showing up. Um, this uh, SLC46A3 gene, and again, um, a, a nod to my biology friends, but the naming could be better. I'm just saying, uh, that said, it could be more intuitive, but this is one of the solute carriers. Um, so it turns out that for every formulation of nanoparticle we did that involved a liposome, whether the liposome was free and engaging with the surface uh, water molecules or whether it was covered with a layer by layer film, every single one of them, um, this gene pops up as being highly significant and it always pops up on the negative side of the chart, meaning that uh, it is uh, inversely proportional to uptake. And here we see that with PLGA and polystyrene, it's just not present at all. So it's only with the lipid systems. And uh, when we look at sort of the weighted average of cell association and the presence of this gene, there is a direct inverse relationship more of the gene expressed, less association with cells that we have with these nanoparticles. And if there is very small amounts of this gene expressed, we see high amounts of association of the nanoparticle with these uh, cells. With PLGA, we saw no pattern. With polystyrene, we saw no pattern. Um, and uh, so this is something that seems to be unique to the presence of the lipids. We did a series of experiments that I then pulled out of the talk because we would run out of time uh, that were in vitro in which we took CRISPR cells in which we removed the SLC uh, gene, which is a gene present in, in most cells. Um, and uh, we can see that we can get huge amounts of uptake if we um, actually take the inverse and we have a cell line that has a very low number of, or amount of this expression, we can CRISPR in the gene and we see that we can essentially change that nanoparticle association to near zero. Uh, so after a series of in vitro experiments, we looked to see whether or not this had any meaning in an, in an animal. And in an in vivo experiment, we looked using fluorescent nanoparticles at the accumulation um, or association with tumor cells. And this was done both with a, an intratumoral injection where we're just getting the particles right in with the tumor and with an IV injection. Um, so this is, uh, this locks me, cell line is one of the lines that intrinsically had overexpression of the SLC46A3. And uh, we had um, ones in which we engineered out that gene and we looked at what happened. So here you can actually see the data for the intratumoral injection. And you can see that the overexpressing uh, versus the uh, low expressing have very different amounts of the nanoparticle associated. And this is after waiting um, uh, a period of time. 
And the intravenous, we still see the difference, though it's not as strong with the systemic delivery that it, as it is with the intratumoral. And here you can see the actual results. You can see the high SLC46A3 and the low. And you can see that nanoparticle association with these tumors at 24 hours is, is quite different. So the question here is, can we use this to actually um, address therapeutic approaches? Now there was, we, we sub submitted this paper, which was ultimately published in Science last uh, fall. Um, and one of the questions was whether or not this is really lipid universal. Uh, they asked if we had tested lipid nanoparticles and all of ours were these nicely formed liposomes. So we did go back and uh, we generated lipid nanoparticles, a range of different ones. This is an example of one of them. Uh, and we found that SLC46A3 expression is in fact predictive of LMP uptake and transfection efficiency. And here you can see some of the transfection efficiency work uh, where um, we can actually look at, uh, again, two different systems, the SLC46A3 overexpressing um, and a control in which we, have, uh, we don't have that gene. And we can see that there's a significant amount of increased transfection and uh, uptake. Here's the uptake, and here we can see the transfection. And this was um, in mRNA, I believe, uh, just of GFP. So we can use this as a mechanism if we can understand it better. How we might be able to util utilize this is still a question. We're talking about the idea of delivering something that knocks it down, um, that is a different kind of vehicle, and then administering more prolonged liposomal nanoparticle treatments. Um, we are also looking at very specific examples of similar genes. So Joelle has gone on in her clinical work uh, to take a subset of data and find that there is a biomarker gene for uptake in pediatric uh, gliomas, and which uh, in toggling that gene also gives you an increase in uptake of, of the therapeutic nanoparticle. So I'm going to pause here, and I, I think I won't have time to show you my third example. Um, which is okay. I think I'd love to have some time for questions. So I'm going to try and move ahead to uh, the acknowledgements and conclusion here, uh, which is that electrostatic assembly uh, can do a great deal in terms of providing a mechanism for multi-drug release, for generating polyelectrolyte thin films that can be manipulated uh, for construction and deconstruction, in uh, the tumor, um, it's, it provides a highly tunable surface chemistry. So even a single polyelectrolyte system can be very exciting in terms of what it can do to drive uh, interactions with cells. Um, it can control trafficking, intracellular and extracellular trafficking, and its localization within the body. The example I wasn't able to talk about is actually treatment of osteoarthritis, and that uses, again, a polyelectrolyte approach in which we are using a polyamidoamine dendromer that is modified with PEG. And using that PEG modification, we can modulate surface charge. Again, the idea is that by modulating surface charge, we can get greater and deeper penetration into cartilage. Uh, so this is the general theme of the work in our lab. And I'd like to thank those who did the work. And I talked primarily about those in bold right here in the corner. Um, and the funding for our work, and uh, welcome any questions you may have. Thank you. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you, Paula. That was, that was outstanding. Uh, we have time for questions. Um, please raise your hand so we can record them. Hi, Paula. Uh, fantastic talk as, as usual. Um, I wanted to ask you about your res, uh, the high throughput screening you did of particles for their association with cells and whether or not there is any uh, heterogeneity in the interaction that you see. I mean, you, you talked about how some cells go in, some cells stay out, some, and there's a hybrid do you see heterogeneity in populations? And to the extent you wanted to target a population of cells, a fibroblast or a macrophage or even a stem cell, 
that you know has somewhat different properties that you're interested in targeting a particle to, could you use some of these screening methods to identify potential nanoparticles that are targeted to subpopulations of the same cell? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, we do see heterogeneity. And um, when we began to, so we have a huge amount of data and that data is telling us how we are tuning association of the nanoparticle with the cell, but not telling us what that association looks like, whether it's external, whether it's internalization, or even whether there is um, there are specific cell compartments that the nanoparticle is attracted to. So we have to do this extensive confocal microscopy work. And you, get, you saw an example of that. Um, we're actually very interested in being able to use um, uh, a more rapid high throughput fact sorting that is tied with imaging. And uh, some of that capability is actually now at the, at the Koch Institute. So our hope is that we'll be able to use more of those kinds of tools in which you're able to not only cell sort, but you're sorting images as well. And by using the right fluorescent labeling, especially with multiple channels, with that kind of approach, you should be able to indicate whether or not uh, the nanoparticle is in an endosome, whether it is uh, sitting at um, the, uh, you know, sort of surface membrane, uh, or whether there's a specific organelle that is associated with. So we're very interested in that. And um, that's been one of the topics of conversation in our lab. Um, I do think though that this initial look at which nanoparticles have any sort of affinity or association at all, give us a, a good uh, bit of evidence uh, and an and idea of where to go forward uh, in terms of the nanoparticle design. Susan. Hi, Paula, thank you for that inspiring and um, really exciting talk. To somewhat follow on Ed's question, um, <clears throat> have you looked at the expression of the SLC A346 <laughs> um, target or gene in non-cancer populations? For those of us who work in drug delivery, not necessarily to the tumor cells themselves, is this something that can unlock new potential for delivery and other applications? Now, that's a great question. So far, all of the cells that we've done these really extensive studies on have been uh, cancer cell related. Um, however, we do think, and, and in talking with some of our colleagues, uh, SLC 46A3 is expressed by most by cells in general, and uh, it, it may actually be a toggle that we can use in other cell types as well. Um, we're still trying to understand the reasoning behind it. Uh, uh, we've been talking with uh, some of the members of the Koch Institute who uh, work on metabolics of, of cells. And there's a belief that it could have to do with the fact that uh, the overexpression of this uh, transporter molecule um, compared to the lack of expression is really giving us a starved state. I don't know if you want to call it starved state for those cells that are underexpressing uh, that cause them to take up lipidic systems. Um, we haven't done the work to prove this, but uh, Joelle and, and a couple of other members of the lab are working with Matt Vanderheiden to see if we can or disprove that idea. Exciting, thank you. And Kurt, before you go, I want the trainees to start crafting what question they're going to ask. Go ahead. Uh, well, a great talk and, and really inspiring work. I want to go back to the, the initial part of the talk where you showed multiple layered particles and you were delivering uh, uh, MIR-34A there to, uh, to the tumor cells, right? Well, MIR-34A is, is expressed in a lot of immune cells that will be interacting with these particles, such as genetic cells, including T cells. It's, it's a major regulatory hub of these cells. So how do you design these particles so that you're not messing up with the machinery of those immune cells? They're still working against the tumor while you attack the tumor. Now, that's a great question. Now, with MIR-34A specifically, uh, it's not clear whether or not um, additional MIR-34A uh, would lead uh, sort of these immune cells down a path that is uh, deleterious or whether that's helpful. However, I have a student who is working on two different nanoparticle designs. One of them is very much along the lines of the ovarian cancer targeting systems, but the other one is using outer layers that have very specific polysaccharides. Uh, she's found one system that is very effective at targeting macrophages, and another uh, that looks like it's going to be effective in targeting dendritic cells. 
And our idea is, can we actually tune the selectivity of these nanoparticles uh, so that we can deliver them perhaps together and target these two different cell types that are present within the tumor microenvironment? Uh, there then the, the competition between these two um, would add to the selectivity. Um, so we are thinking a little bit more um, strategically about targeting only macrophages or targeting only tumor cells. I will say that for the um, systems that I described, the PLE systems, we found that there are, there are differences in the degree of uptake in healthy cells uh, compared to the ovarian cancer cells. The ovarian cancer cells seem to love them, um, but with endothelial cells and fibroblasts, we're not seeing that same affinity. Thank you for your talk. With your PLE nanoparticle system for intraperitoneal injection and then surface delivery by L12, um, where else are those nanoparticles going in addition to the ovarian cancer? Like, are they going into the liver? Are they causing any autoimmune hepatitis signals or any other issues like that? No, that's that's a great question. Uh, when we did this work, now we have much more sophisticated um, animal mo models and work that we're doing uh, with workup. We're not seeing any change in liver enzymes that would suggest we have a problem there. Um, we measured the IL-12 concentration in the blood, and we found that the levels were, were low. They're, they're higher than the control, but uh, quite low compared to the free IL-12. Uh, so we think that we're successful in actually decreasing that. We also look for interferon gamma and um, other, other um, uh, chemokines or cytokines that might be present if we are getting IL-12 activation in the body. And again, all of these, this is sort of analysis of the serum after injection. And what we'll do is it's sort of time study after X amount of time, after Y amount of time, are we seeing a creep up of interferon gamma or its cousins, you know, in, in the bloodstream. Um, and so, so far we have seen that all of the levels are either normal or they're um, just a little above. It is something to keep an eye on. One of the reasons, uh, or one of the motivations for the conjugation is that uh, we indeed do see there's better control of that level because they're tied down now. Thank you. Um, and then I'm not that familiar with the ovarian cancer animal models, but have you started looking at models that have metastatic spread and whether you're able to target the metastases in addition to the primary? Great question. Yes, the, the HM1 uh, model is the one that we're using. And that model, uh, we've also looked at an orthotopic model using Avcar 8 that is not syngenetic. In both cases, we do get metastases, and they tend to go all the around the IP cavity, um, the GI uh, area, all of those areas. And, and we're finding that the targeting goes to those areas too. So we have this very nice image, for example, in which we see METs uh, in the intestine, and we can actually see the nanoparticles accumulate there. Um, I think ovarian cancer, this approach is actually very interesting because um, a sticky nanoparticle system that can uh, be injected in IP uh, would cover pretty much all of the METs that ovarian cancer generates. Ovarian is a little bit unique in that it metastasizes quite a bit, but it's all within that IP cavity space. And so we have this environment in which we can get those solid tumors wherever they are. Yeah. Yes. Hi. Yes. I was wondering what the time frame from for your experiments has been so far, and what is the future um, in moving towards a human being being able to treat in humans. Yeah, I, that is a, an excellent question. Um, for the work that I described using IL twelve, uh, I think that there's some excitement and some interest uh, that we could advance. Uh, we still need to move to. Um, uh, validation of some of the chemistry, some of the tox work. I think tox is probably the biggest uh, thing that we still need to do in animals. Uh, and at that point, uh, we begin to look for uh, friends and partners to work with to take it to the next level and see if we can actually move this to a clinical study. Uh, and that is something that may be possible. Um, uh, there's already been work with my, the same collaborator, Daryl Irvin, looking at alum conjugated with IL-12, uh, and uh, that's an intratumoral injection. Um, we would need a little, to get a little bit more. There's a little bit more hurdle for systemic injection, um, but I think it, it, an interesting path. I think it would still, it's so hard to say, but maybe it would be five, six 
years to get something to a point where you're filing for an IND for where we are now. Um, and when you file for an IND, you get that first trial going. Uh, and then depending on, on the group size and all of these things, it can be sometime a few years after that. Another question. Um, I had a follow-up question. So I wanted to ask a little bit more about um, the potential pathological changes that could um, occur due to administration of the nanoparticles. So um, is it possible that um, there might be some changes that may be occurring, for example, in the microvasculature, if you um, look at the animal when it's sacrificed? Because I know that it was mentioned that you can see some blood biomarkers, but is it possible that if you sacrifice an animal and let's say look at the histological changes, that there could be changes there that weren't necessarily detected by the blood biomarkers? Uh, that's a very good question. Um, we have, we do tend to do a lot of histology uh, for the ovarian cancer work and we have a glioblastoma project in which uh, histology is critical for us to understand what's going on. And we typically don't see significant, I, I think one thing that what one would look out for is whether the nanoparticles are lining up along one certain uh, region of an organ, um, et cetera. We, we don't see that behavior. One thing that I think we would try to keep our eyes out for is whether or not there is a significant macrophage engulfment of nanoparticles. Macrophages love nanoparticles. <laughs> they love everything that they can engulf. Um, or, or, or whether we're seeing a more controlled and targeted delivery. And histology can give us uh, hints about that as well. Um, but so far, we haven't seen um, uh, anything unusual. I think the, the glioblastoma work is a good example of where uh, we're actually very focused on what's happening at the, uh, at the blood vessel level and uh, whether we're seeing transcytosis um, or whether we're seeing, you know, uptake and destruction of our nanoparticle by the endothelial cells. And we actually have uh, a similar set of stories building around uh, the case that different outer layers give us different outcomes uh, in, in that in that area in terms of endothelial um, association with endothelial cells. Question over there? Yes. Hi, uh, again, excellent talk. Um, I had a question about the IL-12 work. Yes. So you showed um, some data comparing the like the nickel histag binding and the thiol malamide. So I know that the thiol malamide is um, a little more reversible than some other covalent bonds. Have you thought about looking at either more stable covalent bonds or about having bonds where you can control the cleavage by some like stimulus um, to like as a function of time or some other like on demand, you know, deliver the IL-12 very good question. Um, so yes, when we looked at the different conjugation chemistries, we thought about uh, sort of the uh, Bertozzi kind of click chemistry, um, the malleamid, which uh, we ended up choosing because it was uh, sort of, there's an ease uh, to, the, to its use and its stability over the timeframes of our interest was still pretty good, which is, you know, like the few days of uh, treatment period. Um, we have thought about using peptides that are going to be cleaved by proteases present in a tumor microenvironment. And so Ivan has another project. Um, this one, he began to get really excited. So we, we ran in, in that direction, but another part of his project was actually um, either attaching the IL-12 through one of these, you know, protease cleavable linkers or incorporating the uh, peptide into the layer by layer film and using the LBL degradation as a gate. Um, now that we're asking questions about whether that layer is covering or surrounding the IL-12, uh, we would need to go back to just the, the, the conjugation at the IL-12 link. Uh, but it is something that interests us because we thought, well, this would give us one more guarantee that we have a uh, few opportunities for IL-12 to be freed systemically until it's, it won't be freed until it's in the environment that we're seeking. So it, it is something that it interests us, actually. Thank you. Wonderful.